two, the method of teaching harmony. The materials involved in the teaching of musical composition are commonly divided up into three subjects, harmony, counterpoint, and form. These are defined as follows. Harmony, the study of simultaneous sounds, chords, and of how they may be joined with respect to their architectonic, melodic, and rhythmic values and their significance, their weight relative to one another. Counterpoint. The study of the art of voice leading with respect to motivic combination and ultimately the study of the contrapuntal forms. Form. Disposition of the material for the construction and development of musical ideas. This division is advantageous for it is thereby possible to study separately the factors which together constitute the technique of musical composition. Nevertheless, the necessity for training in each division of the material, apart from the others, creates excessive separation. The separate subjects then lose their relationship with one another, that affinity which could reunite them in the interest of their common goal. Courses in harmony and counterpoint have forgotten that they, together with the study of form, must be the study of composition, and the pupil, who in, its, who in his harmony course has presumably learned to think and invent harmonically in counterpoint, polyphonically is helpless before the task of combining these individual ab abilities he has acquired and making them serve that common purpose, composition. Therefore, here, as in all human endeavors, a middle way must be chosen. The question is, what viewpoints should guide us in determining it? It will lighten the task of both teacher and pupil if everything presented is so clearly coherent that one thing grows out of another. The first necessity, then, is to restrict attention to the matter at hand, freeing it from all that is more remote. Therefore, it will surely benefit us here, in the study of harmony, to derive the nature of chord connections strictly from the nature of the chords themselves, putting aside rhythmic, melodic, and other such considerations, for the complexity that would arise if all possibilities of harmonic functions were compounded with all rhythmic and motivic possibilities would surely overwhelm the teacher as well as the pupil. Nevertheless, it will occasionally be necessary, even at the most elementary stage, to give directions whose application will not be fully realized until a higher stage is reached. After all, this work is supposed to be preparation for the study of composition. But only such directions could be given as can really serve that ultimate purpose, and others are to be avoided if they contribute nothing to that purpose namely, those that develop certain skills which exist only as ends in themselves, merely because they grow out of the system. In this sense, all harmony courses that, following the old thorough bass method, require the pupil to write out the other voices over figured basses are inappropriate. For there he learns mere voice leading, which might be, to a limited extent, a secondary task of harmony teaching. To expect that the pupil will automatically acquire a sense for good chord progressions from realizing figured bases is no more defensible than to expect that he will learn them through studying masterpieces, where indeed these and better progressions also appear. Then the teacher is relying on the talent of the pupil. By all means, the best thing to do, especially wherever the teacher is not able to influence the pupil's awareness deliberately, wherever he cannot apply explicit methods to produce explicit, predictable knowledge and abilities in the pupil, 
It is clear, at least, that with this, the figured base method, the pupil is not practicing the primary, but rather a secondary matter. It is furthermore clearly wrong to assign the pupil without preparation the task of harmonizing chorales, for he has spent most of his time merely writing parts over harmonic progressions whose effectiveness was determined by someone else. Chorale harmonization requires him to devise chord progressions himself, and he has to be responsible himself for their effectiveness. This task was neither explained nor drilled by the thorough bass method. Of course, gifted pupils may be able to do it moderately well, for these are already equipped, through listening to music and remembering it, with a certain instinct for the right harmonic progression. With them, the teacher has to do little more than touch up minor instances of roughness, weakness, or monotony. The less gifted, or those gifted in other ways, are helpless, since their training dealt merely with voice leading, and they never learn to design a piece of music whose harmonic construction succeeds by virtue of logical progressions. The realization of a thorough bass may have had value formerly, when it was still the keyboard player's task to accompany from figured basses. To teach it today, when no musician needs it anymore, serves no purpose and is a waste of time, hinders more important work, and fails above all to make the pupil self-reliant. The principal aim of harmony instruction is to connect chords with an ear to their individualities, to arrange them in such progressions as will produce an effect suitable for the task at hand, and to achieve this aim, not much skill in voice leading is required. The little that is necessary to deal with forbidden parallels, dissonances, and the like can be mastered rather easily. Besides, courses in counterpoint and form deal in a much more appropriate way with the construction of parts, which is really inconceivable without motivic activity whereas for chord connection not much more is required than to avoid unmelodic voice leading. On the other hand, the melodizing, so commonly encountered, ruins the pupil's taste and evokes in him false notions concerning composition. Das guais meladerisin, that meladisirin, that is, of passing tones and the like, wherever possible, merely to dress up the part writing. See chapters 16 and 17. Therefore, I prefer the older method, which from the outset required the pupil to determine the sequence of chords himself. I start with simple phrases whose purposes grow along with the pupil's skill, from the simplest cadences through modulation to some exercises in applying the skills acquired. This procedure has the advantage that from the very beginning the pupil is himself, in a certain sense, composing. These phrases, which, guided by the instructions, he sketches out himself, can lay the foundation upon which his harmonic sense of form can develop. They will be put together at first without any pretense at effect. The pupil's aims can become more ambitious as the means at his com as the means at his command increase. Thus he learns not merely to understand the means, but also to apply them correctly. As soon as possible a definite purpose will be given to each assignment, to establish, to express the key, that is, the cadence, and then the contrary, to leave the key, that is, modulation. To the latter, I devote the utmost care, for in modulation, as in the cadence, the architectonic, the structural functions of harmony, of chord connection, are indeed most intensely, intensively expressed. Here, also, I go back to older methods, in that I do not allow the abrupt modulation that is found in most harmony texts, where to modulate means simply to juxtapose a few unprepared modulatory chords. On the contrary, 
It will be our aim to modulate gradually, to prepare the modulation and make it evolve, so as to form the basis for motivic development. Analysis of master works shows that modulation, say that from the principal theme to the secondary, occurs almost exclusively in this manner, and since the teacher's task can only be to impart the technique of the masters to the pupil and to stimulate him thereby wherever possible to go on to composing on his own, every other every other purely theoretical method is then clearly irrelevant. We can pass over the question whether such modulations as Richter recommends could ever form the basis for motivic development. Ernst Frederick Richter, Lehrbuch der Harmonie, Leipzig, Breakoff and Her Hertel, 1853. The 25th German edition of 1907 was translated into English by Theodore Baker and published under the title Manual of Harmony. That's New York, G. Shermer, Incorporated, 1912. For Richter's recommendations concerning modulation, cited here by Schoenberg, see page 95 of Baker's translation. We can pass over the question whether such modulations as Richter recommends could ever form the basis for motivic development. It is certainly doubtful. It is probable that, in such abrupt modulations, these... The only modulatory chords recommended, dominant seventh or diminished seventh chords, would be much too artless and primitive. A piece in which such an intense harmonic crisis is manifest surely needs richer and more complex means of modulation. For my part, I have tried to show as many different means for modulation as possible, and to demonstrate, or at least indicate, the wealth of possible combinations. Again, the first exercises in modulation aim merely at the quickest and simplest solution of the problem, but with every newly mastered means the aim must be extended accordingly. If, for example, the deceptive cadence is being used, it should guard the final cadence against the monotony of a repetition, yet assure the final cadence the heightened intensity of this repetition. Thus the pupil learns from the outset to use the means at his command to the greatest possible advantage. That is to say, he learns to exploit his means fully and not to use more of them than necessary. Here we are teaching composition, as far as it can go in a harmony course. Yet it should go, yet it should surely go that far. I have omitted harmonic analysis in this book because I consider them superfluous here. Were the pupil able to extract from the musical literature what he needs for composing, then no one would have to teach harmony. And it is indeed possible to learn everything this way. I myself have never formally studied harmony, and am therefore one of the many who prove that possibility. But most pupils do need instruction, and I say, if you do teach, then say all that can possibly be said. Generally, though, analysis is more a test the author uses for the correctness of his theory than an advantage for the pupil. I do not deny that it would benefit the pupil to account for the harmonic procedure in masterworks, but to do this the way it should be done, that is, by examining the harmonic structure of an entire work and the significance of the individual chords and chord progressions, would be impossible within the limits of a harmony course. Yet, anything else is relatively pointless. Those usual analyses, which show through what keys a theme modulates, or more correctly, show how many chords, however foreign to the key they may seem, a musical idea can contain without leaving the key, this is to show something which is not necessary to show. For whenever the pupil has the means to do it himself, he will understand it so much better just by doing it than he could by analysis. 
That is, he will understand the harmonic aspect of music. The balanced relation of motives to harmony, rhythmic elaboration, in short, what really pertains to composition, if it indeed can be explained at all, does not belong in a harmony course. The pupil is again being shown what is unessential, and I cannot understand how he is ever to grasp the essential if the unessential is always given first place in his study. In general, I do not intend to name individual methods and engage in polemics against them. I will confine myself to explaining things as I understand them. Only when I begin what I believe to be a new interpretation do I find it necessary first to refute the older, usual one. The same reason that leads me to this new interpretation frees me from the obligation to specify which of the ideas presented here I consider new. As a musician who did not collect his knowledge by reading, but who may rather characterize what he offers as the results of his own thought about his experiences in teaching and composing, I presumably have the right not to be fettered by the citation of sources customary in scholarly works. Such unfruitful and time-wasting labor may be left to those individuals whose ties to the living art are weaker than their ties to the theoretical. Instead, I would rather just acknowledge my obvious debt to the existing systems for many ideas. How many ideas and which ones I no longer know. Because of the way I have assimilated them, it has long since escaped my power to be so specific. But I must say, it is mostly to bad books and wrong ideas which forced me to think and find out what is right that I owe the best of this book. Other things came of their own accord from my working through the traditional system. Everything, however, is based on a steady contemplation of art, hence, is first-hand. I think that some of the ideas presented here can lay claim to novelty, and that others may to some extent depart from the familiar, at least in their precision of statement, or in the breadth of perspective afforded by the presentation. I shall gladly renounce the reputation for novelty. However, if I may then be spared the chore of wading through the most important harmony texts. I should like this book to be, wherever possible, a, t a textbook, thus to serve, to serve practical ends, that is, to give the pupil a dependable method for his training. But I cannot on that account forego the opportunity to make known my views through an occasional hypothesis on more complex relationships on the similarities and relationships between artistic creation and other human activities on the connections between the natural world outside ourselves and the participating or observing subject to repeat what is said in this regard is not to be considered theory but rather a more or less detailed comparison, in which it is not as important that it holds in every respect as that it gives rise to psychological and physical exploration. It is possible that this book will therefore be a little hard for the ordinary musician to grasp, since even today he still does not like to exert himself in thinking. Possibly it is a book just for the advanced student or for teachers. In that case, I should be sorry, for I should have liked it, above all, to be of use to beginners. But I cannot change the way things are, and so I must wait. I hope, however, that it will not be too late for the ideas I have to offer when the average musician reaches the point where one may write for him, too, in a manner other than abridged, other than in unterrible picture book style.